Hi, I'm Lenny Rome, the Vault Guy. I'm a cell biologist and an nanotechnologist. My passion is a common particle of the human cell, called a vault. Here's an electron micrograph to remind you what vaults look like. You know, researchers have been working on vaults for almost 40 years. My goal is to explain what vaults are to non-scientists by making some relatively brief videos that someone without a cell biology training can understand. You know, if enough people are interested in hearing the vault story, I'll continue to tell it. So far, my daughter-in-law Tara and I have made five videos. We started with an explanation of the nanoscale world and proceeded to describe how vaults were found and named. We described the first vault publication, how we got our first vault grant, and where vaults are found in nature. I'll put links to all five previous videos below. Today, I want to cover three things. First, I want to describe how we went about analyzing the new particle so we could determine how it was constructed. Second, I want to show you what we found when we took vaults apart. Finally, I'll show you our earliest attempt to understand how the individual vault components come together to form the vault structure. Stick around and I'll introduce a new member of the vault team, Valerie. Val took our research to the next level. Remember back in episode two when I described the various known components of a typical human cell? I mentioned the four building blocks of the cell, amino acids, which are assembled into proteins, sugars, the building blocks of complex carbohydrates, nucleic acids, which are the components of RNA and DNA, and finally, lipids, the primary constituent of membranes. After we isolated the vault and determined that it was a new cell structure, we set out to determine how it was built. Which of the cell's building blocks were used, and how were these blocks assembled? Our studies indicated that vaults were not surrounded by a membrane, nor did they contain any membranes inside. We also looked for carbohydrates, and we couldn't find any of those either. We concluded that vaults were formed from just three large proteins and a small RNA. To examine the vault components, we used a technique called SDS PAGE. It's a very common biochemistry procedure, so I'll spend a few minutes describing it here. First, the name, SDS PAGE. It's an abbreviation for sodium dodecyl sulfate polyacrylamide gel electrophoresis. No, I'm not Mary Poppins, and this isn't supercalifragilisticexpialidocious. It's sodium dodecyl sulfate polyacrylamide gel electrophoresis. Let's take the name apart. SDS, or sodium dodecyl sulfate, is a detergent. It's the same chemical that is used in common household items like shampoo and laundry detergent. Polyacrylamide gel is a thick, clear plastic polymer of the chemical acrylamide. The gel, which has the consistency of a thick, colorless jello, contains microscopic pores that are large enough for proteins to pass through. Finally, electrophoresis. It's a method of moving charged particles in an electric field. In this method, the charged particles are proteins. Now, if you've been paying attention, you would have heard me tell you several times that proteins are formed from individual building blocks called amino acids. In human proteins, there are 20 different amino acids that are attached together by chemical bonds in linear strands, like beads on a string. The sequence of amino acids is called the primary structure of the protein. In their natural environment, though, proteins fold into globular shapes. The final most stable shape of a protein is determined, though, by the sequence of amino acids. You know, proteins range in size from about 100 amino acids to over 1,000 amino acids. And if you have a mixture of different sized proteins, their masses can be estimated by unfolding the proteins, a process called denaturing, 
by coating them with a negatively charged detergent, SDS in this case, and running the protein mixed through a porous gel made from acrylamide. The proteins bind the negatively charged detergent and unfold. They get a negative charge that is directly proportional to their size. So, let's say we have a mixture of three different size proteins. Protein 1 is 1,000 amino acids. Protein 2 is 500 amino acids. And protein 3 is 100 amino acids. The proteins are mixed with SDS, which unfolds and coats them, and then they're transferred to the well in the polyacrylamide gel, and an electric field is applied with the positive electrode at the bottom. The electric field causes the proteins to migrate through the gel toward the positive electrode. The smaller the protein, the faster it will migrate. By using proteins of known size, we can use these gels to determine the size of proteins in a mixture. As an extra bonus, the thickness or density of the band is also proportional to the relative amount of each protein in the mix. The unit we use to describe the mass of a protein is the same unit we use to describe the mass of any molecule. It's called the Dalton, or Unified Atomic Mass Unit. The Dalton is named for the English physical chemist John Dalton, who in 1803 proposed the modern idea of the atom. As a pretty close approximation, think of one Dalton as equal to the mass of one hydrogen atom. So now we understand how to analyze proteins in a complex mixture and the units we use to describe the size of a protein. Let's look at what happened when we analyzed purified vaults on SDS page. We saw three large proteins. The reason we could see the proteins on the gel is because we stained the gel with a blue stain called Komasi Blue. This stain binds to proteins. As you just learned, larger proteins are found toward the top of the gel, and there were three dark bands, indicating that vaults were simply composed of three different proteins. However, all three of the proteins were larger than average. The sizes of the proteins were estimated by comparing how far they migrated in the gel to proteins of known size. The calculated sizes are labeled here. The largest one was about 240,000 Daltons, abbreviated 240 KD. The next largest was about 193 KD, and the third protein was about 100 KD. The 100 KD protein was the most abundant component of the vault. That's why it had the thickest band on the gel. Although the vault RNA isn't stained with the stain we used here, it also runs on the gel about where the lowest arrow is positioned. If we used a different stain, the one I told you about in episode 3, we could visualize the vault RNA. Our analysis determined that the 100 KD protein made up about 70% of the total mass of the particle. We started referring to this protein as the major vault protein, which we nicknamed MVP. A couple years after finding the vault, my lab partnered with a superb cell biologist and electron microscopist from Washington University, St. Louis. His name is John Heuser. John had perfected a method for looking at cells and particles called quick freeze deep etch electron microscopy. The procedure, when applied to vaults, revealed a new and completely unexpected structural complexity. When John applied his technique to vaults, some of the vaults appeared to open into delicate flower-like structures in which eight rectangular petals are joined to a central ring. Here's a micrograph of the closed and open vault, and underneath an artist sketch describing hundreds of John's images. Our interpretation was that the vault was like a barrel and that the flower petals were from opening of the barrel staves. Here's a cartoon to illustrate that model. Around that time, we also measured the total mass of the vault particle. The vault mass was 13 million Daltons. This indicated that the particle was huge, nearly three times heavier than the ribosome. These studies also demonstrated that each vault contains two centers of mass, suggesting that each vault particle is made up of two equal halves, 
what biochemists referred to as dimers. That's why we thought that each vault could break apart at the waist of the particle to open into the two identical flower-like shapes. When we published these interesting images, it finally got the vault particle onto the cover of the Journal of Cell Biology. Here's the cover featuring the open vault. Hmm, this might look good on the wall back there. A few months later, Nancy and I were asked to write a review of our vault research in a review journal called Trends in Cell Biology. And you know, we were selected for another cover when that journal was published. This one featured some vaults alongside of the vaulted ceiling of a cathedral. Do you detect a trend here? In 1991, Nancy departed the lab to take a position with a new startup company in Boston. Before she left, though, she helped me recruit a new postdoc, Valerie Kickhofer. Val was a terrific addition to the laboratory. Not only was she an expert in small RNAs, but she was also one of the best molecular biologists around. After Val completed her postdoc in my lab, she stayed on as a senior research associate, and our collaboration at UCLA lasted for over 30 years. You know, Valerie was a key contributor to our efforts to clone the genes for all the vault components, not just the three vault proteins, but the vault RNA as well. I'll start with the proteins next time and get to the RNA in a later video. I'm Lenny Rome, the Vault Guy. Join me in the next episode where I describe how we cloned the major vault protein gene and what we discovered about the MVP protein. Be sure to comment, like, and subscribe if you enjoy these videos and want to see more. Thank you.